By the end of this section, we will be able to identify the cellular effects of corticosteroid administration and how is this going to serve us in the several clinical uses of corticosteroids. We will also be able to learn the precautions needed before an administration of corticosteroids and will be able to educate our patients on the signs to observe while being treated with corticosteroids. Well, cortisol secretion is under strict control of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Uh, this is under control of the circadian rhythm and the physiological, psychological, and environmental stressors. The hypothalamus is triggered to release the corticotrophin releasing hormone, or CRH, which in turn will stimulate the anterior pituitary gland uh, into secretion of ACTH. ACTH then is um, sent to the adrenal gland where it stimulates the secretion of cortisol which is later uh, activated into cortisol. On a cellular level high dose uh, glucocorticoids have drastic effect on cell cells constituting various tissues of the body. Uh, on osteoblasts responsible for uh, formation of bone, they increase their apoptosis and decrease their uh, proliferation leading to a, a side effect well known uh, which is osteoporosis. It also affects uh, chondrocytes, it decreases uh, collagen uh, secretion and glycan uh, senses uh, which makes cartilage uh, more liable to rupture and complication. It also decreases the proliferation of chondrocyte lineage. Uh, in muscles, uh, they increase in proteolysis and thus causing muscle atrophy. Uh, they also decrease the growth factor expression so there is no replacement for these uh, atrophied muscles. Uh, in the skin, it decreases inflammation it decreases collagen senses, which is responsible for the stria observed with uh, in the skin uh, with continuous uh, glucocorticoid uh, administration. Um, uh, as for adipose tissue, it, increase, it increases uh, uh, the lipoprotein uh, uh, density uh, and the lipase activity causing delivery of uh, triglycerides and free fatty acids to, and deposition into adipose cells. Uh, this causes uh, hypertrophy of uh, adipocytes and uh, it causes obesity in a site-dependent uh, truncal obesity that is uh, characteristic for glucocorticoids administration. So, as we can observe that the effect of corticosteroids on immunity and inflammation is what can have a beneficial use, but all the other effects are inevitably going to be side effects due to uh, the prolonged corticosteroid use. So, uh, as an in anti-inflammatory, it used in a, it's used in a wide range of inflammatory condition. It also it's also used in immune suppression. But every other thing is a side effect, including immune suppression, as it can result in exacerbated uh, infection. Uh, if its effect on myocytes causes um, atrophic myopathy, uh, uh, on osteoblast uh, blast it causes osteoporosis, and in old age and very prolonged use can cause osteonecrosis. Uh, it also uh, it, it causes other side effects, as you have probably discussed this in in uh, in your lecture. Uh, this is not what uh, is our concern. We are just concerned about the things uh, that can result in side effects that can be manageable. On a cellular level, uh, glucocorticoids have if have an effect on mature immune cells and they also affect the precursor of these immune cells. Glucocorticoids decrease the rolling adhesion and activation of neutrophils by damage in the delirium. Uh, this leads to decrease their uh, inflammatory effect mediated by the neutrophils. Uh, mm. This also leads to, as they are no longer ad adhesive to the damage in the delirium, their count increases slightly in complete blood picture so we notice increase in neutrophilic count uh, as for the precursor they decrease the maturation survival and differentiation of uh, precursor of t cells and uh, which in turn will activate b cells so this decreases both cellular and humoral immunity
uh, it also stimulates uh, apoptosis, which will lead to uh, death of these precursors. Since inflammation is the primary role of corticosteroids that's going to be applied in clinical use, we need to look closer on a molecular level how corticosteroids or glucocorticoids uh, affect inflammation. Well, corticosteroids in low dose uh, differ from high dose, and we're going to illustrate that. Uh, corticosteroids in low dose, as they are cholesterol in nature, they're lipid soluble, they cross membranes. Uh, in the cytoplasm, they bind with glucocorticoid receptors. Uh, this complex, the glucocorticoid receptor complex, traverses the nuclear membrane where it acts in the nucleus. In the nucleus, the DNA is packed in chromatin, dense chromatin. It's not going to be able be able to be expressed in this form. You have to deacetylate this chromatin leading to less tightly bound chromatin. This exposes uh, the genes that needs to be transcribed. Well, glucocorticoid receptor complex actually prevents this deacetylation step. Thus, the chromatin remains packed. The genes are not available for transcription. These genes that are not available for transcriptions are the gene for inflammatory stimuli, the gene expressing it cytokines, chemokines, adhesion molecules, and others. So by preventing the expression of inflammatory genes, this results in anti-inflammatory effect. This happens in a low dose. In a high dose, its mechanism of action is a little different. Well, the corticosteroids also transverse the membrane, bind to corticosteroid receptors, forming glucocorticoid receptor complex that traverses the nuclear membrane, where it dimerizes. It dimerizes and causes uh, uh, promoter genes. It, it binds to a glucocorticoid response element on, uh, on the DNA. Glucocorticoid response element is responsible for activation of promoter genes. These genes promote anti-inflammatory genes like annexin-1 or lipotropine-1 and other anti-inflammatory proteins. Uh, this is the mechanism of action uh, of the anti-inflammatory effect of corticosteroids, but in a high dose. Well, the first clinical application and use of corticosteroids in, is in repla replacement therapy. Replacement therapy is where there is adrenal insufficiency or insufficient secretion of cortisol uh, from the adrenal gland in the body. This results in Addison's disease. It comes in two forms. The acute form, acute Addisonian crisis. We use IV formulation of corticosteroids to replace uh, uh, replace uh, cortisol immediately. Uh, the first formulation is cortisol hemisuccinate and cortisol sodium phosphate. We need fast acting materials that can be administered uh, intravenously because this is an emergency. The other form is the chronic Addison's disease. A famous person who had the chronic Addison's disease is President Kennedy. Uh, well, we use cortisone acetate. When we use cortisone acetate, we, we need to use it in combination with other mineral co corticoids because um, in Addison's disease, the case is it's not just cortisol insufficiency. There is usually mineral corticoid insufficiency. So uh, instead of using cortisone acetate in combination with a mineral corticoid, we can use fludrocortisone. Fludrocortisone can be used alone because it has both corticosteroid action and mineral corticoid action. Well, we can divide the clinical uses of cortisone into emergencies and chronic uses. As for emergencies, we've already mentioned Addisonian crisis, myxedema coma. Myxedema coma is a crisis of hypothyroidism. Corticosteroids are used to elevate the blood pressure and increase uh, the conductivity of the heart, increasing the heart rate, so it just manages to make the case better until we uh, administer thyroxine. 
It's also used in shock for the same reasons. In hypovolemic shock, it increases the blood pressure, enhances the organ perfusion. It's used in anaphylactic shock because it's a shock and because corticosteroids decrease uh, the inflammation uh, causes stabilization of the mast cell, so it decreases the anaphylactic uh, process. It's also used in neurogenic shock, also because it's a shock, and because it decreases substance B responsible, uh, the B mediator responsible for the exacerbation of the neurogenic shock. It's also used in stimulation of lung maturation in fetus. This is not. Uh, done uh, routinely. This is only used in cases where an emergency C-section is going to occur. Uh, uh, we administer uh, corticosteroids uh, injections uh, for the mother uh, to enhance the maturation of the lung uh, in the fetus in uh, emergency C-sections or in premature infants uh, because corticosteroid injection uh, enhances surfactant secretion which will lead to uh, proper uh, lung maturation. As for chronic uses, it's used in allergies, all different kind of allergies, in especially bronchial asthma. It is of great importance in uh, bronchial asthma. It stabilizes the mast cells, it decreases inflammation, it, inha it decreases antigen antibody reaction if this uh, asthma is due to uh, exposure to allergens. Uh, it also decreases a uh, cell mediated anti uh, cell mediated immunity and uh, humoral immunity. It just decreases inf inflammation on all levels. It's used in allergic sinusitis, allergic rhinitis, all different kinds of allergy or atopy. It's used as an anti-inflammatory for the cellular effect on the neutrophils we've discussed and it decreases also the precursors of inflammatory cells. Uh, it's used in uh, encephalitis, uh, rheumatic carditis, uh, it's used in uh, hepatitis, nephritis, nephrotic syndrome. It's just used in a lot of uh, uh, inflammatory conditions. It's also used in autoimmune disease because it causes immune suppression. Autoimmune disease is excessive ac activation of immune uh, of, of immunity against self cells uh, that causes disease uh, like uh, inflammatory bowel disease, like rheumatic arthritis. It decreases the synovitis, enhances the symptoms greatly. It's systemic lupus erythematosus, myelia gravis, and polyarthritis nodosa. It's used in a variety of autoimmune disease because it causes immune suppression. It's also it also causes immune suppression, so it's of use in organ transplantation, whether the induction of organ transplantation or the maintenance of the immune suppression after organ transplantation. It also has a variety of dermatological uses. It's used in allergic conditions like eczema, urticaria. It decreases scar formation, as in keloids. Uh, it's also used in um, uh, uh, exfoliative dermatitis. It's used in various dermatologic conditions because it decreases mainly because it decreases inflammation. As we've mentioned before, that the uh, cortisol secretion is tightly regulated by the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Cortisol or glucocorticoids have feedback mechanism where they suppress the secretion of their releasing hormone CRH and ACTH. So when we administer corticosteroids uh, uh, from the outside uh, for a long period, there is inevitable uh, suppression of this axis. Well, this axis acts in our favor because any excess glucocorticoid will be will lead to suppression of CRH and ACTH, uh, maintaining a constant level. When we administer corticosteroids from the outside, it's not physiologic. We try to mimic the physiologic doses, but it's not going to be like how our body does it. So there are going to be side effects, and there are going to be side effects that we need to monitor to prevent uh, major problems. First and foremost, one of the major problems uh, that is associated with corticosteroid administration is the increased blood sugar. Prednisone increases fasting and postprandial blood glucose levels. In diabetic patients, they should adjust their hypoglycemic medication according to their physician recommendation. Also, monitoring is important. The tricky part in 
in cases of borderline diabetics or pre-diabetics, prednisone may temporarily decrease their blood glucose level enough to push them into the diabetic category where they will need medication. So regular blood glucose monitoring is crucial while on corticosteroids. Another issue that is faced when using corticosteroids, especially long term, is osteoporosis. To understand this, we need to understand that uh, bone formation is a balance between osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Osteoblasts that are responsible for bone formation and osteoclasts that are responsible for bone resorption, uh, that is responsible for uh, regulating the calcium levels. Excessive glucocorticoids or continuous glucocorticoids administration will lead to decrease the proliferation of osteoblasts, increase their apoptosis, and hence decreasing bone formation. On the other hand, it increases the survival of osteoclasts, enhancing their bone resorption activity. So this will lead to unbalance between bone formation and bone resorption with bone resorption taking the upper hand leading to osteoporosis decrease the density of the bones this administrate this is a demonstration uh, on the difference between normal bone and osteoporotic bone as you can see the spaces increase this is very fragile bone that can be susceptible to pathological fractures so what we can do to prevent osteoporosis is to educate the patient that they discuss with their physician the ways to protect uh, their bones while on steroids. Uh, when there is an, an evidence of, uh, of uh, osteoporosis, medication that can be used are vitamin D and calcium that increases the position of calcium in the bone. Um, uh, bisphosphonates like alendronate and cilantronic acid, uh, sex hormones because they are uh, anabolic in nature like androgens, anabolic agents like parathyroid hormone or fluoride, and also casetonin. It's important that we uh, emphasize the importance of exercise. Exercise uh, transcends the bone uh, and makes it less susceptible to osteoporosis and pathological fracture and also bone mon uh, bone density uh, monitoring is crucial one side effect that will uh, increase uh, in likelihood uh, on continuous use or prolonged use of corticosteroids is cataract uh, this can be easily detected by regular slit light exams so this can become a routine that uh, patients uh, being on steroids for a long time they should undergo slit light exam uh, routinely Insomnia is another issue that uh, a lot, uh, prednisone can affect sleep pattern and contribute to insomnia and sleepiness, especially that cortisone is uh, cortisol secretion in nature in physiological condition is tightly bound by a circadian rhythm. So if insomnia occurs on corticosteroid use, it's best to take the dose in the morning to minimize the impact on nighttime sleep. What of the detrimental effect of prolonged corticosteroid use is it causes proteolysis throughout the body, except in the liver, causes uh, bl uh, uh, glycogen senses uh, to increase, but it causes uh, glycogen degradation and uh, proteolysis in muscles and other tissues. Uh, so uh, a diet rich in protein uh, should be advocated to decrease this effect, uh, the atrophic myopathy. Uh, also, uh, uh, corticosteroids is known to increase the blood pressure and causes uh, with salt and water retention. So uh, we should advocate diet restricted in uh, sodium intake, in salt intake, uh, as it causes obesity. So the patient should be advised also to decrease their carbohydrate and fat intake. The problem of oropharyngeal candidiasis is encountered in patients, especially bronchial asthma and bronchitis patients that are uh, that are using inhalational forms of 
corticosteroids. A uh, prolonged use of inhalation uh, corticosteroids can cause uh, decrease the inflammatory cells and decrease the immune cells in the uh, uh, mouse and the pharynx. So this causes uh, candida to uh, proliferate and cause oropharyngeal candidiasis. So patients who are going to be used glucocorticoids inhalers should be advised to have proper washing of their mouses using gargles to avoid this side effect. A uh, a precaution in withdrawal of corticosteroids. Uh, strict hypothalamic pituitary access control over the secretion of cortisol necessitates that prolonged administration of corticosteroids any longer than a week causes suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Thus, withdrawal of glucocorticoids must be gradual until the restoration of the hypothalamic pituitary axis function is obtained.